This podcast contains adult themes and graphic violence. Listener discretion is advised. A commercial-free version of this podcast is available on Patreon for $1 a month. Patreon.com forward slash Beyond Contempt Podcast. I'm Renee, and this is Beyond Contempt True Crime. I have little to say about this episode, except I've wanted to cover it for a while now. And sometimes, it's just nice to take a break from murder. You're listening to episode 14, Lisa Nowak. In 1962, NASA had been contemplating putting women in space. John Glenn, who was the first American astronaut to orbit the Earth, strongly opposed the idea of women in space and spoke out at a congressional meeting. He said that men design, build, and then fly airplanes into war. Women were not a part of the aeronautics field because it was just the social order of the way we organize life. So at that point in time, they banned women from becoming astronauts in the United States. On May 10, 1963, the Rockville, Maryland couple, Alfredo and Jane Caputo, brought their first of three daughters, Lisa Caputo, into the world. A few weeks later, Russian cosmonaut Valentina Tereshkova would step onto the Vostok 6 and perform a three-day solo space mission. She was the first woman to travel into space. Lisa's parents didn't realize it yet, but Valentina's expedition would have a significant impact on their firstborn and created a new career path that had not been open to women before. In 1969, Neil Armstrong uttered the words, The Eagle has landed over NASA's communication system, and everyone watched the Apollo moon landing on their black and white TV sets with undivided attention, including six-year-old Lisa Caputo. Lisa's parents would often take her to the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., since they only lived 20 minutes away. When Lisa declared to her mom that she would be an astronaut one day, her mom told her that there were no female astronauts. Lisa challenged her mom on that notion and informed her that NASA had accepted women into their astronaut training program. Lisa was a bright child who enjoyed math and science. As she grew older, she gravitated towards more intellectual hobbies like reading, crossword puzzles, sailing, and gourmet cooking. Lisa took part in student government and was on the math team. In 1981, she was named the Student Athlete of the Year for her last year of high school. She played field hockey and ran track. In 1981, Lisa graduated from C.W. Woodward High School with the title of valedictorian. That same year, the Columbia STS-1 launched its first test shuttle mission from Kennedy Space Center in Florida and landed 54 hours later at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Lisa had been accepted into Brown University, which was an Ivy League institution, and her parents were enthusiastic about her attending college there. But she wanted to pursue her dream of becoming an astronaut, so she enlisted in the Navy and attended the Naval Academy in Annapolis, where she majored in aerospace engineering. The Naval Academy was a male-dominated organization and had only been open to women for five years prior to Lisa's arrival. On induction day, the cadets are weighed, measured, poked, and prodded. They receive haircuts and are issued a uniform with combat boots. They learn how to salute and address their superiors. When Naval Academy cadets take their oath to defend the Constitution of the United States, they ask them to look at the people sitting to their left and right. The Academy makes it crystal clear that one of those two people would not be with them at the graduation ceremony four years from then, and their experience at the academy would not be an easy one. Lisa said goodbye to her parents at the end of induction day. She was filled with nervous excitement as she entered plebe summer. After induction day, the experience of being at the bottom rung of the military becomes very real. The plebes embark on several weeks of mental and physical training. 
They learn how to accept getting yelled at by upperclassmen and must sit at attention while eating in the cafeteria and have to avoid resting on the back of their chair. When they walk across the yard, the plebes need to run. They are exercised to exhaustion daily. Pleep Summer is an introduction into firearms training, military discipline, finding personal limits, breaking down cadets, and then building everyone back up as a team. They granted plebes some free time between summer and fall. Lisa's parents visited with her during this time and saw changes with their daughter, but they both had no experience with the military, so they didn't really understand what was going on. Lisa's days at school were full because she was carrying 18 credits, and it was hard not to be overwhelmed by her new environment. Her morning started with getting harassed by upperclassmen, testing her on the facts in her plebe handbook, which was followed by marching to breakfast. The rest of the day, Lisa attended classes that were intertwined with athletics, and she was subjected to more upperclassmen harassment. The cadets had three hours of study time in the evenings, and lights out was at 11 p.m. Rinse and repeat. It was tough, but Lisa persevered. She met another aerospace engineering student named Richard Nowak in her third year at the academy. He was a few months her junior, and they attended the Naval Academy ring dance together, which was a major formal event at the school. Richard and Lisa graduated the academy in 1985, and President Ronald Reagan gave the commencement speech. Lisa was sent on temporary duty at Ellington Field Joint Reserve Base in Houston and provided engineering support for the Johnson Space Center Shuttle Training Aircraft Branch. It was thrilling for her to see everyone at the Space Center supporting a common mission. At that point, she knew that she had to be part of something larger. Lisa entered flight school in Pensacola, Florida in 1985. In 1986, she was closely watching the STS-51L mission. On January 28th, Space Shuttle Challenger blew up 73 seconds after launch, and all seven astronauts on board were killed, including high school teacher Krista McAuliffe. Even after this major tragedy, Lisa was not deterred from flying. She earned her wings of gold in June 1987, which was awarded to a naval flight officer at graduation. Lisa and Richard were married at the chapel at the Naval Academy in Annapolis on April 9, 1988. It was a traditional military wedding that included the saber arch ceremony, where the couple walked underneath the Arch of Swords saluting them. In 1990, Lisa attended Naval Postgraduate School in California, and in 1992, the couple welcomed a son named Alexander. The same year she had her son, Lisa completed her master's degree in aeronautical engineering and also a degree in aeronautical and astronautical engineering. When there was a roadblock in the way of a goal, she circumvented it. Lisa had less than perfect eyesight, but had applied several times to become a test pilot. She finally got in on her sixth try. They transferred her to Maryland in 1992, and she started U.S. Naval Test Pilot School and was enrolled in the Aerospace Engineering Duty Program. Lisa had an immaculate military career, where she eventually earned the rank of captain, had logged 1,500 hours of flying aircrafts on 30 different types of planes, plus worked on aircraft weapons and navigation systems. Lisa had to go through a Navy review board before they could consider her for the NASA program. When she received the Navy's approval, she was one of thousands of people who were seeking a position at NASA. In 1996, they asked Lisa Nowak to join their team, and she was one out of 44 individuals in NASA Astronaut Group 16, nicknamed the Sardines, because the class was one of the largest. The Nowak family of three promptly moved to Texas. Richard took a job with Berrios Technology and worked as a flight controller. Lisa began her astronaut candidate training, which included jumping in the pool with her flight suit and swimming 75 meters, followed by treading water for 10 minutes. She trained on survival techniques and rode in a reduced-gravity aircraft, better known as the Vomit Comet. Lisa learned how to solve problems when faced with emergencies. Besides all the simulations for every type of potential encounter, she also had to learn about the shuttle and its navigation system. In 
In August 1998, she was no longer considered a candidate. She was part of the team. She wasn't selected to go into space yet, but she had several areas of responsibility. Lisa worked as a personal casualty assistance officer, which is the individual who contacts a family when something happens to an astronaut. Lisa worked in robotics and trained for robot arm manipulation at the space station. She worked in mission control as the lead communicator with shuttle crews. She was highly motivated and was patiently waiting her turn to be on one of those space missions. Lisa wanted another child and didn't want to put it off any longer since she was now in her late 30s. In 2001, she gave birth to twin girls, Katrina and Alyssa. The NASA publicist had been pregnant at the same time Lisa was. The two women bonded over their shared experience and would often talk. But when they passed each other in the hallway at work, Lisa would not make eye contact with her friend. Looking back, this was perhaps a minor sign that Lisa had a different type of personality. Juggling the three children was a difficult task with two high-achieving military careers in one household. Richard and Lisa worked three- to seven-day shifts with a variety of overnight and extended hours. He had to be painstakingly organized to ensure that the kids had a parent home to care for them. On September 11, 2001, the World Trade Center was bombed, and the NOACs expected Richard would be sent to Afghanistan. In 2002, they called Richard to active duty, and Lisa was suddenly a single mom with a demanding job and three kids to care for. On February 1, 2003, the Columbia Space Shuttle had disintegrated when it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, returning home. Lisa lost three of her friends, including Dr. Laurel Clark. Lisa supported Laurel's husband, Dr. John Clark, and his family. Lisa spent long days with the Clark family, comforting them and helping them grieve, and even helping them with the military paperwork that accompanies the loss of life. NASA's reputation took a hit after they performed a root cause analysis on the Columbia disaster. The report determined that it was the culture of NASA as an organization that had caused the crash because they aggressively made compromises to reach their space exploration goals and did not balance those goals with safety considerations. They suspended flight operations for over two years. This was a hard time for many of the astronauts at NASA. Not only had they lost their friends in the shuttle disaster, they weren't sure if they would ever travel into space after investing years of training and sacrifice. During this time, Lisa started to form a closer friendship with fellow astronaut and Navy commander William Anthony Ophelin. William and Lisa worked in the same space on the sixth floor of one of NASA's buildings. Fraternization was not prohibited for federal employees, and NASA followed the same rule book. In 2004, Lisa covertly began an intimate relationship with Commander Ophelin. They went on a work trip to Canada that January, where they received training from the military on cold weather survival tactics. They hid their affair from co-workers and their spouses since they were both still married. Some of their co-workers noticed their increased interaction, and only in hindsight realized that they shared more than a friendship. William was known as Billy O to his friends. He was born in 1965 in Virginia, but grew up in Anchorage, Alaska. Billy grew up in a military family with a father in the Air Force, who instilled a love of airplanes in his son. Billy performed his first solo flight at 14, in a small single-engine plane. He received his electrical engineering degree from Ohio State in 1988 and married his high school sweetheart the same year. Billy attended the famous Top Gun Navy Weapons Fighter School. In 1995, he was accepted into test pilot school, and in 1997, he applied to be an astronaut. Billy logged over 3,000 hours in 50 different types of aircrafts, he completed his master's in aviation systems from the University of Tennessee in 1998. Commander Ophelin was one of 25 individuals in NASA's Astronaut Group 17 in 1998. They selected Lisa on November 18, 2004, to be a mission specialist on STS-121. She'd finally be going into space. Lisa's work hours increased at NASA, plus they sent her on weeks-long training trips. With all the intensive training that Lisa had to do to prepare for the space mission, 
Richard had to take a more active role at home in caring for their three children. Meanwhile, Michaela Opheline, Billy's wife, noticed that the connection between her and her husband was not as solid anymore. When she pressed him about what was wrong, he wouldn't provide her with real answers. She read emails between Billy and his co-worker named Lisa. The exchanges were warm and cozy, too cozy for a working relationship. She had her answer. When she confronted Billy, he was unmoved. It was over between them, and the dissolution of their marriage was inevitable. Michaela filed for divorce in February 2005, and it was final by May of that year. Billy wanted Lisa to leave her marriage, but she thought it didn't make practical sense to leave her husband. Lisa continued on with her life as usual, including attending church on Sundays with Richard and the three kids, and then she saw Billy on the side. After several delays, the STS-121 Discovery Mission was scheduled for the summer of 2006. The aim of the mission was to resupply the space station and test out new safety and repair methods that had failed during the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster. They would test out the robotic arm to see if it could sustain additional weight. The idea was to someday put a person out on the arm so they could repair the space shuttle. The countdown to launch was on, and Lisa's parents hosted a pre-launch party at Johnson Space Center with her family and friends. However, they could not interact with Lisa because all the astronauts were in quarantine, which was standard NASA protocol. It prevented the astronauts from getting sick and bringing a serious illness with them into space. After several days of delays because of bad weather, the STS-121 crew ate the traditional NASA pre-launch meal of steak, eggs, and cake and boarded the shuttle on July 4, 2006. They allowed astronauts to bring approved personal items with them on the space mission. Among the items Lisa took were a Naval Academy flag, and her deceased grandmother's engagement ring. Houston, all systems go. While some foam pieces came off the shuttle after launch, it did not damage the shuttle or compromise the safety of the flight. Lisa spent 13 days in space and operated the robotic boom arm. The crew referred to Lisa and her fellow robot operator Stephanie Wilson as the RoboChicks. Lisa also acted as a flight engineer and helped with the navigation of the shuttle. During the mission, Shuttle Discovery landed and dropped supplies at the International Space Station. Lisa was not chosen for the three spacewalks that were performed during the trip. Because of her small stature, she would not fit into the large or medium-sized spacewalking suits. The crew received a call from President George Bush, who thanked them for their service and wished them well on their journey. The crew even enjoyed food created by Emeril Lagazi, who was known for his spicy Cajun style of cooking. Astronauts in space do not wake up to alarms. NASA has a long-running tradition of starting the astronauts' day off with music to energize them for the busy day ahead and to build team morale. The songs are chosen by the astronauts' friends and family. The STS-121 Discovery crew woke up to songs like Clocks by Coldplay, Just Like Heaven by The Cure, and the theme from Charlie's Angels. The songs Lisa Nowak's family selected for her were Good Day Sunshine by the Beatles, played on July 7th, since astronauts see a sunrise every 90 minutes, and All Star by Smash Mouth, played on July 11th, which reminded the crew that they were rock stars, and only shooting stars break the mold. Shuttle Discovery came back to Earth on July 17th and made a perfect landing. Everyone was safe and sound. It was a huge success for NASA, who wanted to put the Columbia disaster behind them. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. Hi, everyone. I wanted to tell you about BetterHelp Online Counseling. It's an affordable service where you can connect with one of their 3,000 U.S. licensed therapists. You can find counselors that specialize in anxiety, depression, stress, relationships, trauma, grief, or LGBT issues. I work from home and don't often like to leave my house. So I really appreciate that you can communicate with your counselor from the privacy of your own home via text, chat, phone, or video. So if you've been thinking about getting counseling, there's never been a better time 
because Beyond Contempt True Crime listeners will get 10% off their first month with a discount code Beyond Contempt. To get started today, go to betterhelp.com slash beyond contempt. Fill out the questionnaire to help them determine your needs and get matched with a counselor that you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash beyond contempt. Now, back to the show. There was a lot of fanfare when the astronauts returned home. It was a whirlwind of speaking engagements, signing autographs, and celebrations. Lisa seemed to have a difficult time integrating back into everyday life. This was understandable, as most people would feel deflated after accomplishing a major life goal without having the next objective lined up. The cracks in Lisa's personality were revealing themselves. She got into a verbal disagreement with another female NASA employee over pens to sign autographs. The pens were in a drawer and not sitting on the table ready to go. Lisa didn't have time for that nonsense. Lisa got in another squabble with a different NASA employee. When the woman went to get her purse out of a drawer, Lisa aggressively stepped in front of her and blocked the woman from getting her property. Lisa's marriage wasn't going well. Richard had been carrying the weight of taking care of their family for a long time because of Lisa's astronaut training. Annie needed her to take a more active role in caring for their kids. A position had opened up in one of the upcoming space missions. Lisa was considered for the role, but ultimately it was given to Stephanie Wilson because she was a team player. NASA gave Lisa a communications position, but she considered that a backward step in her career. Since she had that role prior to her space flight. It was looking like the Discovery shuttle flight was Lisa's first and last mission. She also noticed that Billy had been more distant with her. There was a time when he clamored for her to leave her husband at the beginning of their affair, but now he was not always returning her calls. She wasn't properly reading the signs that their time together had run its course. In November 2006, Bailio had met a woman named Colleen Shipman, 13 years Lisa's junior. Colleen had been a high-performing student-athlete in high school who competed in gymnastics, track, and volleyball. She graduated from Center Area High School in Manaka, Pennsylvania, in 1995. Colleen double majored in chemical engineering and German and joined ROTC when she attended Penn State. She achieved the rank of captain in the U.S. Air Force, where she was employed as an engineer. Colleen attained her master's degree from Penn State in 2002. In 2005, she took a job on the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base. Billy and Colleen met at a NASA party in Florida. He quickly fell in love with her, and they were in an exclusive relationship shortly after their initial meeting. Billy told Colleen about Lisa and said they were no longer together. However, Billy wasn't forthright in that he had not clearly communicated to Lisa that their affair was over. He was under the impression that Lisa understood that him not returning her calls and texts as much communicated to her that they were done. And Lisa was under the impression that Billy wasn't as responsive with her because he was getting ready for a space mission. He was on Space Shuttle Discovery for their 14 day mission to the International Space Station in December 2006. The major aim of the STS-116 mission had been to perform repairs on the space station. Colleen and Billy's relationship was burning hot, even when he was in space. Colleen sent Billy O an email with the subject line, I need a rub down. In the email exchange, Colleen said, I will have to control myself when I see you. The first urge will be to rip your clothes off, throw you on the ground, and love the hell out of you. When Billy's space mission ended, he mostly ignored Lisa's attempts to call and text him, which she did repeatedly. Billy and Colleen continued to get more serious when she introduced him to her family. Lisa and Richard's marriage hadn't been good for quite some time, and they officially separated in January 2007, after 19 years. Billy finally used his words and told Lisa that their affair was over. 
he had fallen in love with another woman. Lisa was a practical and stoic woman. Billy thought she took the news well. So was business as usual between them at work. Billy felt so confident that her feelings were not hurt from their breakup that he placed a picture of Colleen on his desk at work. When Billy O had been on a space mission, he took a charm that Colleen had given him. He took a picture of the keepsake as it floated inside the shuttle and emailed it to Colleen. When she had a hard time identifying her gift in the photo, she emailed him the following. I don't see the charm, though. Pant, pant. It's like those erotic hidden picture games that they have at the bar. Only you're fully clothed in the picture. She went on to say that when she thought about Billy without his clothes, that it was pretty nice. There were several email exchanges where they proclaimed their love for one another. Lisa still had a key to Billy's place. And on January 23rd, she went inside his apartment when she knew he was at a meeting, since she had pressed hard at work to get a copy of his post-mission schedule. Lisa knew Billy's passwords and was able to get into his email from his home computer. She saw the intimate emails between her ex-boyfriend and his new girlfriend, Colleen Shipman. She also saw a flight itinerary and was now privy to the fact that Colleen was planning to visit Billy. They were going to spend some time together in Texas, and then Colleen would be returning home on February 6th. Lisa took three days vacation at work and started planning. Captain Lisa Nowak reportedly slid on a diaper, stepped into her Honda Pilot, and started on a 14-hour road trip. There would be no time for bathroom breaks as she drove the 900 miles from Houston, Texas to Orlando, Florida. She needed to confront Captain Colleen Shipman. Nowak arrived at the Orlando airport on the night of February 5th. At 12.33 a.m., Lisa was wearing a disguise that consisted of a wig, trench coat, and red glasses. Colleen's flight landed at 1.05 a.m. Lisa was seen on the airport security footage trailing behind Colleen as she headed to the baggage claim area. Colleen's bag was late, so she killed some time at the airport and picked it up after 3 a.m., Colleen jumped on the shuttle bus at 3.28 a.m. There was a woman strangely dressed in a trench coat on the bus, but Colleen didn't think much of it. As Colleen got off the bus and headed to her car, she heard footsteps behind her. Colleen quickened her walking pace because she now heard a person running behind her. Colleen jumped into her car, locking the doors, and the woman in the trench coat was rapping on her window. This strange woman said she needed a ride. Her boyfriend was supposed to pick her up, but he had not shown up. Colleen told the woman that she couldn't help her. The woman in the trench coat took another approach and asked to borrow Colleen's cell phone. Colleen was quick on her feet and proclaimed that her cell phone was dead. The woman in the trench coat changed tactics again and asked Colleen to roll down her window as she cried for personal effect. Colleen only meant to open her window an inch or two, but the automatic roll-down feature took over, and there was no barrier between her and the woman standing outside her car. Before Colleen knew what was going on, her eyes started burning. The woman had sprayed her with something. Colleen swiftly closed her window, threw her car in reverse, and peeled out of the parking lot. A parking booth attendant called the police for Colleen. Law enforcement arrived quickly on the scene, and found a suspicious woman who had dropped some items into a trash can. They detained her, and Colleen confirmed that this woman was her assailant. After further investigation, law enforcement determined that the person wielding the pepper spray was a woman by the name of Lisa Nowak. Colleen had just visited her boyfriend Billy Owen Houston, and he accidentally called her Lisa while they were in bed together. This was that same Lisa. After her arrest, they found that Lisa possessed a kill kit, which consisted of $600 in cash, gloves, a steel mallet, a 4-inch folding knife, a BB gun, rubber tubing, and garbage bags. There was a map to Colleen's Cape Canaveral home, a love letter to Billy, printouts of the intimate email communications between Billy and Colleen, and a computer disk that contained images of bondage scenes. The police report stated that the bondage images were both photographs and drawings. 
The women in the pictures had a varying amount of clothes on. It was unclear what purpose the photo served for Nowak. Police charged Lisa Nowak with attempted kidnapping with an intent to inflict bodily harm or terrorize, burglary of conveyance with a weapon, and misdemeanor battery. The judge set her bond at $15,500. When more serious charges of murder were laid on her, her bond went up another $10,000. Her attorney had successfully argued that she only wanted to have a conversation with Colleen and that her only infraction was to use pepper spray. Lisa returned home to Houston on February 7th with her GPS ankle monitor, which would trigger a call to police and Colleen Shipman if she went to Florida. The attempted murder charge was dropped a month later because the prosecution didn't think they could prove it. Orlando detective William Benton had searched Nowak's car and found two used diapers inside of a trash bay. The police report stated that Lisa had used the diapers to avoid stopping for bathroom breaks on her trip from Texas to Florida. They also found a few dozen new diapers in the trunk of her car. Once all this information was released to the media, and they realized that astronauts wear diapers when they launch from and re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, the story blew up. This was a PR nightmare for Lisa Nowak and her highly skilled criminal defense attorney, Donald Leikeback, who didn't shy away from high-profile cases. He worked to limit the damage. Donald explained to the public that the diaper story was very titillating, but it was also very untrue. He said that they left the diapers in the car when her family evacuated Houston during Hurricane Rita in 2005. And to be fair, there was never an explanation provided as to how Lisa could have changed her diaper when she was driving. Nowak made one stop on her journey to Orlando. There was a receipt showing that she had checked into a day's end between Houston and Orlando. She registered under the alias of Linda Turner and paid cash. Years later, at a hearing before a Naval Review Board, on August 20, 2010, Lisa repeated her lawyer's explanation for the diapers. Regardless if the diaper controversy was true or not, the diaper jokes were running rampant in the media. Lisa had quickly become a punchline on late-night TV. Autographed photographs of her were going for high-dollar amounts on eBay. They played the security video of Lisa stalking Colleen in the airport parking lot. Lisa's disheveled mugshot photo made its way across both print and TV news and was the perfect visual representation of the astronaut who had fallen from grace. Lisa's attorney did what he could, and he hired a PR person to help control the bad press. This incident became a PR nightmare for NASA and the space program. They had only recently come out from under the shadow of the Columbia disaster, and now it was a public indictment of NASA and their failure to properly screen astronauts for mental health issues, another blemish on the record. Right after the incident, they removed Lisa from all mission activities and put her on a 30-day leave of absence. Before her road trip, she was supposed to have served as the chief communicator between Mission Control and the crew of the shuttle Atlantis for its next flight that was scheduled for late April 2007. She was officially dismissed from NASA on March 8, 2007. Having a pending felony charge would mean she couldn't pass a background check, and that would exclude her from being an astronaut. This was the first time in history that an astronaut had ever been dismissed from NASA. They sent her back to the Navy because she was a naval officer on assignment to NASA and not a NASA civil servant. NASA believed that it was the Navy's responsibility to deal with her. When interviewed by investigators, most of the NASA personnel saw nothing in Lisa's personality that would have predicted her downfall. The one disparaging thing that a few staff members said was that Lisa wasn't a very good team player. She was selfish, did not go out of her way to help others. Just as NASA was trying to recover from the Lisa Nowak incident and focus on their April shuttle launch, Another major incident hit the press. An engineer who worked at the Johnson Space Center was unhappy with his performance review. He pulled out a 38 caliber pistol and shot his supervisor and shot himself. There NASA was in the headlines again with another employee who had mental health issues. Many people felt that part of the blame for Lisa Nowak's mental health should have been laid at the feet of NASA. They hired more people than they could ever use. 
and then they placed everyone in a hyper-competitive environment where people were desperate to make it onto a space mission. NASA recruits astronauts every two years. 2,000 to 4,000 pilots, engineers, and scientists apply. Only 110 are invited to try out and undergo a week of mental and physical evaluations. And only 20 are typically chosen. Some years, the odds are even more substantial. In 2013, 6,000 people applied to the space program, and only 8 made the final cut. NASA does initially screen all its potential astronaut candidates. During their evaluation process, all potential candidates interview with clinical psychologists and psychiatrists. There are tests that help isolate personality traits, that help NASA identify the people that are competitive workhorses and that are goal-orientated. They try to weed out the people who are hostile, anxious, depressed, or have any identifiable signs of mental illness or instability. But after that initial screening, there are no further meaningful evaluations. The astronauts can get counseling for personal issues, but they have to seek it out and ask for it. In the hyper-competitive NASA culture, most would not risk seeking help because it would get them removed from a space mission. A former NASA psychiatrist believes that the organization plays too much into the narrative that the astronauts are heroic and lead extraordinary lives. This creates an atmosphere of celebrity worship, ego inflation, and entitlement. These are things not easily lived up to, and often there can be a letdown once those lofty goals were achieved. Even the famous astronaut Buzz Aldrin had problems with depression and alcohol after his time in space. In 2009, Lisa took a plea bargain and was sentenced to one year of probation with 50 hours of community service. She received no additional jail time other than the two days she had served when she was initially arrested. As part of her deal, she pled guilty to felony burglary and misdemeanor battery. Lisa also said a quick apology to Ms. Shipman. Does your client have anything she wants to say? I think she does, Judge. Come forward, Ms. <clears throat> I'm glad to have this opportunity to apologize to Ms. Shipman in person. Why don't you turn and face Ms. Shipman when you do this? I'm glad to have the opportunity to apologize to you, Ms. Shipman, in person. I am sincerely sorry for causing fear and misunderstanding and all of the intense public exposure that you have suffered. I hope very much that we can all move forward from this um, with privacy and peace. The Navy downgraded Lisa's rank from captain to commander. They gave her an other-than-honorable conditions discharge in 2011, which meant she could not re-enlist in the military and was not entitled to veterans' benefits. Lisa had been working at the Chief of Naval Air Training Station in Corpus Christi, Texas, at the time. Had Lisa not taken a deal, her lawyer was ready to go to trial. He brought in Richard Pesikoff, a Houston psychiatrist who had over 45 years of experience in his field and was not unfamiliar to the courtroom. He had diagnosed Lisa with a single episode of severe depression and mixed mania, bipolar disorder, obsessive-compulsive disorder, and Asperger's syndrome, which now falls under the umbrella of autism spectrum disorder. Dr. Paul Siegel, an assistant professor of psychology at Purchase College, was interviewed on 2020 and was skeptical of the diagnoses given to Lisa Nowak. He did not personally interview Lisa, but drew conclusions from court records, police interviews, emails, and media interviews. He believed that someone diagnosed with Asperger's would have made marriage, an affair, and a family unlikely. A bipolar diagnosis would have made it difficult for her to excel in Navy flight school and would have been identified by NASA's screening process. He thought that Lisa had a personality disorder. People with personality disorders behave in a way that departs from the culturally standard expectations that we have in relationships. They have problems with how to relate to others and how they perceive themselves. Lisa was so jealous that she attacked Shipman, and it was almost as if she became a different person. This was a different stressor that she had not been exposed to before. 
It was a stress that NASA could not have screened for because it was brought on by a unique event. Another psychologist, Thomas Nagy, who has authored three books in his field and specializes in psychotherapy and adjustment disorders, did not want to diagnose Nowak since she wasn't his patient. But he said that people who are subjected to large amounts of stress or have a chronic disorder can perform ill-conceived acts which would normally not fit their character. Lisa was subjected to an inordinate amount of stress leading up to her crime. Her marriage was falling apart. She lost three classmates in the Columbia disaster, including her close friend, Laurel Clark. Her space flight had been seven months prior to her attacking Shipman and was only the second flight since losing the Columbia shuttle in 2003. She was dealing with the increased training and pressure at work and taking care of Laurel's family, as well as her own. Her boyfriend broke up with her and fell in love with someone new, and she would most likely never be part of another space mission. Whether this incident was created out of the overachiever culture at NASA and their failure to screen candidates, or was an abrupt onset of mental illness that could not have been predicted, everyone has seemingly moved on from the events of 2007. Lisa Nowak is 56 years old today. Her son is 27, and her twin daughters are 18. Lisa lives in Texas and works in the private sector. She does not give interviews and wisely avoids the public spotlight. Richard Nowak divorced her in 2008. Billy O was also sent back to the Navy by NASA in May 2007. NASA never disclosed their rationale, but most likely, Billy was part of their PR nightmare, and he needed to go. Colleen and Billy married in 2010. They moved back to his home in Alaska, and they have one son. The couple retired from the military in 2008, and they jointly run a website called AdventureWrite.com, which is a creative writing site for children. Colleen Shipman published a novel called Erie under the pseudonym of Sia McCoy in December 2015. You can get it on Amazon in paperback or digital format. With 151 reviews and an average of 4.5 stars, people seem to enjoy it. When asked if she forgives Nowak, Shipman says, quote, She committed a crime. She was convicted. She finished her sentence. I'm not sure there's really anything for me to forgive. Unquote. Immediately after Colleen was attacked, she described her life as being debilitating, and she didn't leave her house for a six-month stretch. Colleen still has anxiety issues years after the incident. She never leaves her house without her gun, and she's always armed. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Beyond Contempt. There's a movie out right now called Lucy in the Sky that is based on the Lisa Nowak story. It stars Natalie Portman and John Hamm. Many people are giving it poor reviews, so skip going to the movie theater and wait for it to come out on Netflix. Please visit beyondcontemptpodcast.com for links to the sources used in this episode. This episode was researched by Laura Delgado. Script writing, editing, and all audio production were performed by me. If you like the show, please leave me a favorable review in Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much, everyone, and we'll talk in two weeks. <laughs>